Let me pray and then we will jump into the book of Haggai. God, what a grace to be known by you, to be able to draw near to you in faith, belief that apart from your work in us was completely impossible. Um, Just not something we were looking for. We were running the opposite way away from you, not wanting to draw near to you in faith, not wanting to give up our own earthly comforts, our own ways, convinced that we were wise in our own eyes. We were, and yet you rescued those of us who believe, and now you've given us uh, good desires um, to, to go labor in hard places, to send loved ones, family, uh, beloved friends, and church family to uh, a hard place to labor. And who could produce that but you uh, for the reasons that we're going? And so we thank you, God. Such things uh, are not truly <laughs> a sacrifice when comprehended and, and seen in the light of eternity. These are small things, trivial things to give up comforts here, to leave the safety of what feels like safety here in Arizona, to go to a hard place in New Orleans. It's not truly a sacrifice, but it is indeed a privilege to go and be ambassadors with your word. Um, There's nothing that we could say or do to repay such kindness that you would allow us to labor for your namesake. Help us now as we turn our attention to the book of Haggai to grow in our esteem for your word, to grow in our love for you, the God who speaks, and God, of course, uh, more eager to submit ourselves, to submit our hearts to your will in its entirety so that you would receive all the glory. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Open your Bibles to the book of Haggai. We're back in Haggai, finishing chapter 1 today. Unfortunate as it is, there is a thick fog enshrouding the church regarding the doctrine of sanctification. We've talked about this before. The biblical teaching on holiness becoming more like Christ, imitating Jesus so that we know how to walk as he walked. That doctrine, the doctrine of sanctification, is really simply what the Bible teaches about our practical obedience to God. And yet there's so much confusion in our day. And we are so confused that we have so bought into the culture's psychological view of man that we treat disobedience our various besetting sins, like mental disorders. As, as much as we would like to, we really can't help the way we are. We were born that way. There's not much to do about it. The way the culture talks about, treats so-called mental illnesses is the way we think about, unfortunately, besetting sins and disobedience oftentimes. If you read widely enough on the Christian blogosphere, you'll uh, find certainly from some writers that they're not even sure people can really change at all or that obedience really isn't in people's grasp, even as believers, with a new nature and with God's word and with God's people and all of his other resources. We just, in these people's view, are just bound to live with perpetual weaknesses because, well, We're just messy people. (laughs) That attitude, the attitude seems to be that since obedience is so unlikely, we can be content with merely feeling good about God. That we should concern ourselves primarily with our emotional state, the emotions that exist between us and God, because practical, real, tangible Obedience and comprehensive life change is just ever out of our reach. And that's just not true. That is not true. Christian, know that that is not true. And even as I say that, you might know, well, yeah, that's not true. But how often do we treat common weaknesses, 
regular sinful habits perhaps as if we're just doomed to live with them. We're not. That's good news. This passage, while this passage in Haggai doesn't say everything the Bible has to say about obedience, it does teach what happen to be some foundational components of true obedience. This passage, one thing that is abundantly clear, wonderfully clear from this passage is that change from disobedience to obedience is indeed possible. It is possible. In this life, it is possible with God's help. And so Haggai, in this passage, in verses 12 to 15 today, he's going to describe for us four components at work in obedience. Let me read our passage, starting in chapter 1 at verse 12. The prophet writes, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, listened to the voice of Yahweh their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as Yahweh their God had sent him and the people feared Yahweh. Then Haggai the messenger of Yahweh spoke by the commissioned message of Yahweh to the people saying, I am with you declares the Lord, declares Yahweh. So Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work on the house of Yahweh of hosts, their God. On the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. This passage describes four components at work in obedience. As Haggai records for us the historical details of God's remnant rebuilding God's house, at least four components to their obedience become evident. And these components that were, that were at work in the remnant's obedience in the past, these are abiding principles for us in the present. In other words, what we happen to read, what we read happened historically, still applies to us in principle today. So as we see just in the description of the historical events from Haggai, we ought to receive instruction regarding this area of the Christian life, regarding obedience. And the first component at work in obedience is this, number one, proper reception. Proper reception, verse 12. This is what's being described, their proper reception of Haggai's words, verses 2 through 11. They culminate in what happens in verse 12. And I want you to notice there's lots of words in verse 12, but all of those words orbit around one word, and it is the word listened. Listened. Everything that verse 12 says finds its relationship to the verb listened. He listened is is the simple verb. He listened. It refers to Zerubbabel and Jehozadak with him and with them all the people. A singular verb referring to three categories, if you will, Zerubbabel, Jehozadak, and the people. They all did this. They all listened. This is the word being heated. This is the word being heated. It was heralded, we saw that last week, from the prophet. He declared what God said, and he faithfully did so, as we'll see in our passage. And the word that was heralded was immediately heated by the people. This is phenomenal obedience. This is admirable obedience, is what we're seeing. In verse 15, it tells us the date associated with these events, uh, especially when the work on the house began. So this second section in the book, uh, 
get, comes with a date in verse 15. We just read that at the end. 24th day, sixth month, second year of King Darius. So this is 23 days later than the date that was mentioned in verse 1, which was the first day of that same month. Between the time that they heard the rebuke from God and the time that they actually went to work on the house, only 23 days elapsed. And commentators differ about why that lapsed. I think the best explanation for a lapse of 23 days, the time that it would have taken them to gather materials, to organize and arrange themselves, and to do those things in the midst of a harvest season, I think that accounts well for why they didn't actually start the work for 23 days. This isn't delayed obedience. This is the amount of time that immediate obedience took them to actually put their hands to the work and rebuild, begin rebuilding the temple. I want to just make one correction on uh, something I said last week. Darius the king, Darius was a Persian king, not a Median king. Darius the Mede that we hear about in Daniel. So for whatever that's worth, these men were about a hundred years apart, likely. I don't know if that means anything to you. <laughs> But just know that these are different Dariuses. So this is the date associated with this second section. And what we witness in the verse is the role that proper reception of God's word plays in true obedience. Just note that the, the remnant's obedience, this is the leaders included, Zerubbabel and Joshua, the governor or civic leader in Zerubbabel and the religious leader, the high priest at the time, Joshua, and all the people, that remnant, how they heard the word was of utmost importance. How they properly received the word is what's in view in verse 12. This involved hearing the word rightly, assessing the word rightly, and applying the word rightly. When it comes to how the word is received by a church, by a corporate group of people, or an individual, all of these things must be at play if true obedience would be the result. When they listened, when you listen, these things must happen. A right hearing of the word, a right assessing of the word, and a right applying or application of God's word. Just notice how they heard the word in verse 12. The word comes, verses 2 through 11, and then it names the leaders and the remnant, and it says they what? Listened. They listened to the voice of Yahweh their God and the words of Haggai the prophet. Very important details. When the word came, it came through a human medium, a prophet, Haggai. And they didn't hear it as the words of mere man. So when they listened, their hearing the word rightly involved hearing it as God's voice in Haggai's words. And you can't draw a distinction between them because they are joined by that small conjunction and they didn't listen to the words of Haggai then to the voice of God or listen to the voice of God and then sometime later or in a different word, way hear the words of Haggai. The point here is their right hearing involved hearing God's voice simultaneously as it came through man, this human prophet. And every time you open your Bible, that should be happening. You should be inclining your heart, inclining your hear, ear to hear God through the human vessel, the prophet who wrote. That's good, good hermeneutics, a good way to interpret, if you will, God's word. Never draw a distinction between 
between the human writer in Scripture, that's the lower, that's the biblical writer lowercase a, and the divine author, capital A. There is no distinction here. And in the same way, every time we open up God's words spoken through his prophets, now preserved for us in Scripture, we should receive them the same way. This is proper reception. And if you would obey God, you must receive God's words in the same way. The divine intention is coming through the human words, the human author. Also, the proper reception included assessing the words rightly. The voice of Yahweh their God came through or with the words of Haggai the prophet. And then what was their assessment? They listened. Remember, all of the phrases, all of the words have their relationship to listen. They listened as Yahweh their God had sent him. As Yahweh their God had sent him. The point here is, when they receive the word, their opinion or assessment of the word is that it was actually God's words. As Yahweh their God had sent him is how they received it. So the divine intention, what God intended in sending Haggai, they accepted. And so the humble acceptance is also in view. How did they assess this? This is divine. And so they humbly received it. Proverbs 2.1 says the same thing. Human father, Solomon, tells his son, if you receive my words, if you just receive them, come to them, they're coming to you, your job is to hold out an empty hand and just take them for what they are, for what they say, whether they offer rebuke or encouragement, comfort or warning, just take them is the idea. And the people did this. They listened to God's voice, to the words of Haggai, how as Yahweh their God had sent Haggai. The same principle is evident in other places. I want to just show you this in a couple other places. Uh, go to Exodus chapter 14. Again, we find ourselves back in the Pentateuch, Exodus 14. And this is Moses' own commentary as he speaks for God, writing the Torah, of the people's response when they saw the Egyptians drowned in the Dead Sea. Exodus 4, verse 30, or excuse me, Exodus 14, verse 31 Then Israel saw the great hand, not just the hand, they saw the great hand which Yahweh had used against the Egyptians. And what did they do? The people feared the Lord and believed in Yahweh and in his servant Moses. Who did they believe, God or Moses? Yes, they did. They believed them both. How could it be any other way? The only way they, the only access they had to God's word was through his prophet, through Moses being sent. And so in order to believe God, they had to believe Moses. Both of those things working in conjunction with each other. Fast forward to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 20. Here, Israel's in trouble again. They're rescued again. Verse 20 of 2 Chronicles chapter 20 says, When they arose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa, and when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, O Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Establish your faith in Yahweh your God and you will be established. 
establish your faith in his prophets and succeed. Here, faith is duly warranted to the prophets and to the Lord. So to believe God as they're being encouraged before this victory, they're being encouraged to take faith, to have faith, put their faith in the Lord and in his prophets. What does this mean for us, this principle? Well, this means, like I've said, you can't divide God's words, the divine author from the human author. But when you open your Bible, do you, are you prepared to believe the men that wrote it? Are you prepared to believe the men that wrote it? It's easy, you think, to believe God. He's perfect, without flaw, only does what is right. Do you trust that God when he spoke, as he spoke, through these human vehicles? Flawed though they were, what they did not err in doing was writing scripture. We can agree that the men that wrote the book are flawed. They're not shy about chronicling their own faults. The point is, God used flawed men to write perfectly, flawlessly. Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Every word of the Lord is tested, and in the end proves true. John Calvin helpfully says this, Haggai confirms here the truth that the people received not what they heard from the mouth of mortal men otherwise than if the majesty of God had openly appeared. For there was no ocular or visible view of God given, but the message of the prophet obtained as much power as though God had descended from heaven and had given manifest tokens of his presence. We may then conclude from these words that the glory of God shines in his word, that we ought to be so much affected by it whenever he speaks by his servants as though he were nigh to us face to face. When God's word is accurately opened, clearly, accurately proclaimed, do you take that as God speaking? as if he were in the room with you, saying it for himself. That's the the message that we should receive. That's what we should understand from this principle, from this passage. A proper reception of the word must be at work in all true obedience. As the people obey, this is how they receive the word properly. The second component at work in obedience is faithful speech faithful speech, true obedience on our part also requires this, faithful speech. It requires faithful speech from God, from his prophets, and from anybody else bringing us God's word to be obeyed. If we're going to obey God, each, at each of those levels, faithfulness must be consistently, truthfully communicated. Think about first God and his connection with our own obedience. Think if God failed to speak faithfully, either he was intentionally deceptive or just incapable of accurately communicating his own intentions, his own will, his own thought for your life, but you were really eager to obey him. You would be in a world of trouble, wouldn't you? If God intentionally deceived or just couldn't clearly communicate his will, obedience would be impossible. Well, what if you had a faithful God, eager, willing, able to communicate his word clearly, but he couldn't do it through human means? So everything you have in the Bible, not accurately, not faithfully communicated still we would be in a world of trouble. God, his mouthpieces and the prophets must both be able 
to faithfully communicate God's words or else obedience is impossible. Look at the response of the people in verse 12. What did they do as a response to Haggai's message? What does it say? They feared the Lord. They feared the Lord. This was a right application, a right response to hearing what God said. And then in verse 13, it goes on to say that Haggai, the messenger of Yahweh, spoke by the, as the LSB renders it, commissioned message of Yahweh to the people, saying, I am with you, declares the Lord. So here we see that faithful speech is in view. The people's response demonstrates that it was accurately communicated. God, who intends to glorify himself, here gets what he intends in being feared or glorified by the people. So the God who's worthy of all worship intends to be worshiped when he speaks as a right response to his his voice. Here, this right response comes forth. So you know the message was faithfully communicated. But then also the, the faithfulness of Haggai's speech is evident in what he writes in verse 13. He calls his, his own self, writing about himself in the third person, then Haggai, he calls himself the messenger of the Lord, the messenger of Yahweh. And he says about himself, he spoke by the commission, the message of Yahweh, and he did it to the people. What's required for faithful speech, the one speaking, must consider himself, he must see himself as a messenger. The one who speaks not only must see himself as a messenger, but he must be one who speaks God's message, not his own. And he must seek the good of others. All of these things are at play in verse 13. He is the messenger of of the Lord. He speaks God's message. And he speaks for the people's good when he says, brings this word from God, I am with you. So he's faithful to his, to his duty. Uh, he doesn't, it's, it's helpful to just notice that here Haggai, he's just the messenger, a mere messenger, right? Bold speaks with authority, takes the lead in causing the house to be rebuilt. Those are significant duties in his role, but still he's just a messenger. That means the message is not his own. He doesn't have a right to go say to the people what he wants to say. He's been given something, and his uh, quality as a messenger is determined solely on the basis of his adherence to that message. How well can you say what I told you to say? That's it. And so he does that. He speaks by this commission message, this uh, formal, authoritative declaration that has to come from God. He did that, of course, in what we've already seen in verses 2 through 11, but he does that again now that you have a listening people, a people fearing the Lord. He brings now again new revelation from God in these few words. I am with you, declares the Lord. I am with you, declares the Lord. This is, I mean, for, for a people who is eager to obey God, this is all they needed next. A brief, encouraging word from the Lord. I am with you, declares the Lord. You know, God here speaking for himself, not only assures the people of his empowering presence, we'll get to that in a second, 
not only of his presence with them to empower the work that they've taken up to do, that they've purposed to do in their hearts at this point because they fear God now, but he also reminds them that he's the one that said it, declares the Lord. It was kind of like me sending one of my kids, go tell mom, quote, I like you a lot, declares dad, says dad, right? I want you to know it's coming from dad for sure. And this is what God is doing. God apparently is not only interested in speaking to his people, but he's interested in his people knowing that it's him speaking. And so he does this, assures them that this is indeed not just the words of Haggai. This is coming directly from the mouth of God. And so he strengthens the people in this way. God strengthens his people in this way, which leads us to our third component at work in obedience, and that is divine involvement, divine involvement. Obedience doesn't happen without any of these things. A proper reception of God's word, faithful heralding, faithful speech, and communication of God's message, but certainly it it can't happen without this divine involvement. The point is God must produce obedience in his people. And anytime any of us has ever obeyed God, we have had God to thank for it. All praise be to God for any ounce of obedience. Divine involvement. We see this in the very encouragement that Haggai gave. I am with you, declares Yahweh. So here he is assuring his people of his empowering presence. He's actually granting this people who's listening to his voice, his empowering presence. That means I'm there with you in the work. It's not an either or, I'm I'm with you or I'm causing you or for you in what you're doing, but it's both. I'm with you as you undertake your, your acts of obedience. As you go about, as you have purpose now out of a fear of me to obey me and rebuild the house, He said that just verses up, go up to the mountains, verse 8, bring wood, rebuild the house so that I would be pleased and I would be glorified. The people heard that, okay, we got to, so that we would be acceptable to God, he would be pleased. We got to glorify him by building the house. And now that that is their attitude, they're listening. Now he's bringing an encouraging word. And, and you need to know, as you do it, I'm with you. I'm for you. I'm going to empower the work. Tremendous implications for us. Here's, here's a couple things to consider. They haven't even completed the obedience yet. They're not done obeying. And God is already eager to assure them that he's with them. The encouragement comes as soon as at the first glimpse of a desire and an inclination to obey. Think about you parents. Do we do this with our children? Right? As soon as we see an inclination to obey, as soon as there's a, there's a movement, any movement toward obedience, are we there eager to urge them on, eager to encourage them, eager to strengthen their hand to follow through. That's what God's doing for his people. It is, it is a remarkable display of God's tenderness and eagerness to bear with his people, even in their weaknesses, so that they know of his approval as soon as he can give it. I am with you. Think about how you conduct yourself in your own counsel to one another in the body? Are you as eager as God to give encouragement? Do the people you go to bring correction, admonishment, instruction, do they feel the weight of your tenderness? Sounds like an oxymoron, 
when you go to each other, when we come to each other and offer help, do we each feel the weight of encouragement coming to us, even when, when there has to be a rebuke, right? There's nine verses or so of rebuke. Are you that eager, that willing, that competent in bringing encouragement at the first sign of obedience? Do you use encouragement to spur on good works in each other? We must be. We should be. We should be known for this. We should be marked by this. I want you to notice that as God grants his empowering presence in this encouraging word, I want you to notice the timing of the utterance as well as the timing of the blessing. When, when does he say this in, that he is with them, this, this uh, good word, this blessed word, if you will? He says, I am with you. That's present tense right now. Not I will be if you just keep on. No, I am with you right now. And you should think of God that way. In, in, in your most meager efforts, To obey him, he is with you. In any inclination you have had to do good, he is with you in your obedience. So be encouraged. Right now, today, he's with you in every single act of obedience. And I also want you to notice just the timing of when this came. This is verse 13 after all. It's not verse 2. I am with you, declares the Lord. Here comes the encouragement only after they've listened and begun fearing the Lord. So both are important. He's with them presently as a people willing and eager to submit themselves to God's voice, to God's prophet. And sometimes we get this backwards, don't we? God, I want to know that you're with me before I go obey, before I make up my mind to do the hard work of obedience, I want to feel your nearness. I want to experience your comfort. And then if you do what I want you to do and you make me feel a certain way, I can feel your nearness, then I'll decide to obey. Now that's backwards. And God's not having it. He's God, you're not. Once he's regarded as God, worthy to be feared, then immediately comes all the encouragement you need. And how do we know even at this point, as soon as they listen, I want to just draw your attention to another detail, very different from what we've seen so far. This appears three times in this passage. Verse 12 they listen to the voice of Yahweh who? Who's God? Their God. And then it's repeated again. As Yahweh, their God, had sent him. And then the same language is used in verse 14. And they came and did work on the house of Yahweh of hosts, their God. Their God, their God, their God. It's like all of a sudden, they're worthy of owning God, of claiming him as theirs. Now that they listen, now that they fear him, he can rightly be called their God. If you're not willing to obey God, if you don't walk in a fear of him, then you should not call him your God. That's only in the abstract. That's only imagined. He is truly our God as we listen to his voice. And he is only our God if we listen to his voice. Do you remember how he referred to them in verse 2? When he started speaking through Haggai, he said, this people says, he didn't claim them either. Now they are his people. He is their God. 
now that they have listened and now that they fear him. This divine involvement, God is granting his empowering presence to enable the work, but he also, this divine involvement includes God's awakening of his slumbering people. God does does this. He awakens his slumbering people. Look at verse 14. So what happened? He stirred up, or literally, he caused the spirit to awaken. (laughs) He caused. This is a specific way of saying it in the Hebrew to say that God's doing it. It's, It's similar to Psalm 23, he makes me lie down, right? This is the idea. He makes it happen. He causes it to happen. What did he cause? He caused the spirit to be awakened. Zerubbabel, Joshua, all the remnant of the people. This is corporate obedience. It's like almost time to bring in the kingdom. (laughs) All of Israel's obeying. And he stirred up the spirit to do something that they would come and do the work on the house of Yahweh of hosts their God. Whenever obedience is happening, God is ultimately the one who gets the credit. Just here, as he stirred up the spirit of his people to go do his work, whenever we find ourselves doing his work, You want to know why that's the case? Ultimately, look no further than God's own involvement in your life. He is at work in you both to will and to work according to his good pleasure. Finally, the last component at work in obedience is this. Ongoing labor. Ongoing labor. In verse 14, it says that they went working in an ongoing or a continuous way. Because it says, and they came and did work on the house of Yahweh of hosts, their God. This is even here, not immediately apparent in, in the English, but written here in a way that captures incomplete or unfinished action. This isn't completed action. They did that. They came and they did that. And now they're done. But this is apparently at this point in the process, unfinished work. So it could be translated that they kept coming and kept doing the work of God, doing work on the house of the Lord. They were continually doing it. Their obedience was characterized by ongoing labor. They weren't done. They saw it all the way through, is the idea. And this ought to characterize us in our obedience. You're not done obeying until you've obeyed all that the Lord has commanded. And who can say that? I've obeyed all. I'm done. And I can be done for the day. Uh, not until death. And so obedience, genuine obedience, true obedience, God-empowered obedience must be characterized even for us by ongoing labor. Let me just close with uh, this word. Kyle taught this a couple weeks ago from Luke chapter 17. And again, this just captures so well how we ought to see ourselves as those laboring in conjunction with an all-powerful, good God to obey him. Luke chapter 17, verse 10, Jesus says, In this way you also, when you do all the things which are commanded of you, say, we are un." worthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. That's a great attitude to have. As unworthy slaves, will we submit ourselves 
fully and thoroughly to the Lord. If you can say yes, then know that God is with you in all of your works, and you should be encouraged to press on in obedience, Christian. And we're going to see more in the coming weeks about how God even responds to our meager, inglorious efforts to obedience. Let's pray. pray. God, thank you for such an encouraging word that ought to compel us forward in our efforts to know you as we seek to press into the kingdom that is coming where Jesus will perfectly reign, subduing all of his enemies, reversing the curse so that creation perfectly works with man under his authority for the first time since Eden. God, would you give us encouragement and comforts along the way as we look to you as our sufficient help, sufficient guide, our good shepherd to empower all of our efforts to obey you so that you are glorified in the world, so that your name is exalted, so that this church, even Grace Bible Church, is a good pillar upholding the truth. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.